Thank you for joining us, friends, from snowy Ithaca, New York, which is home to Cornell University. That's not an April Fool's joke. There is snow on the ground, but spring is in the air at last here in beautiful New York State. Today's guest, Michael Fontaine, is a professor of classics at Cornell University. In addition to lecturing, Professor Fontaine has also held a number of high-level positions in Cornell's central administration, most recently as Associate Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education. His recent publications include How to Drink, A Classical Guide to the Art of Imbibing, uh, published by Princeton Press, and the Oxford Handbook of Greek and Roman Comedy. Today we're here to discuss Michael Fontaine's brand new publication, How to Tell a Joke, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Humor, by Marcus Tullius Cicero, with translation and commentary by our guest, Michael Fontaine. Uh, Mike, welcome, so great to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, I'm happy to be here with you. You bet, so congratulations on the publication of your book. Uh, I know it's a long process. Um, you're, a, you're a classics professor at Cornell, like I just mentioned. And then the time I've known you, which is a few years at this point, uh, you have been particularly focused on jokes and drinking and how they can be enjoyable endeavors in and of themselves, but they can also be fruitful and beneficial to one's personal standing, uh, possibly even bringing you power and prestige. Would you please explain? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, somebody has to talk about drinking and joking, right? It yeah. has to be. Uh, and so the lot fell to me. I'm happy to do it. But you see, so these are social activities, right? So the, the book on drinking is fantastic because it teaches you the rules of getting along in professional life and how to cope with alcohol. So that was pretty cool. It was the world's first uh, drinking manual written in Germany about 500 years ago. And it's all about how to navigate this stuff, you know, partly at work. Um, the new book is even more exciting for me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be doing this because it's all about how to tell jokes and uh, exert personal influence and grow your influence how to get along with humor at the office and make life just a little more fun than it needs to be. So uh, this book is 2,100 years old, this stuff, but it is solid gold. I'm super excited to be doing this. By the way, I heard that uh, you had Bill Clinton on here as a warm-up act for me in one of these keynotes the other day. So that's a new one for me. I'm excited. Yeah, good. Congratulations on that as well. He was with us last week for a keynote. Um, you know, in our conversation the other day, you were telling me how this book uh, and previous works uh, were actually constructed and based on some some formative experiences that you had at Cornell, Cornell University. One is acting dean of faculty, and another is associate vice provost for undergraduate ed, like we just described. Um, sorry, but these don't strike me as particularly humorous endeavors. Uh, what what was the deal? What happened during these experiences? Well, so one of the um, amazing things around a university, uh, this will either be a total shock or old news to you, is. We're always trying to get people to do something, but we never have any money to pay them to do it, right? So the only way to get people to volunteer is goodwill, humor, create some laughs. And in all these roles, uh, I did one for four years. It was a volunteer role where I was trying to staff up all these committees and call up people and say, hey, how would you like to join the committee for this, that, and the rest? And they said, what do you get paid? And I said, well, not a lot. Uh, but so humor and keeping it light um, has been huge, and uh, it's been good in big public debates we've had in our faculty meetings. It's been even better in some of our internal debates um, where we were deciding on strategy or tactics and things along um, for the university. So it can always break the tension and just really remind us, you know, the sky is still blue. Life goes on. Nobody's really all bad or all good. And it kind of restores perspective. It's really been helpful. That's great. Oh, you know, I want to address the audience really quickly. Welcome, everyone, uh, from wherever you're joining us from. Quick tip here. If you want, if you have some questions for Michael and I, uh, simply drop them in the chat box. So at the top of the right of your video player, you'll see the chat dialog box. Drop some questions in there. We'll get them throughout, and I'll try to uh, manage as many as we can at the end here uh, and throughout our discussion um, shortly. So let's talk about um, the focus of today's conversation. You and I have actually done two keynotes prior, uh, an absolute blast, and we'll share some uh, URLs for those related to ancient history, ancient Rome. Let's talk about the big daddy, the prime mover, the stand-up consul, Cicero. Uh, who was Cicero, for those of us who are not familiar with him or his work? And most important, more importantly, where does he sit in the comedic pantheon? I mean, what was it that made him unique in Roman society, and why are we still talking about him today? That's terrific. So I'm going to, uh, those questions are all great. I'm going to address all of them right here, I think, by showing some of these slides to our audience. Uh, that is Cicero right there, our marble statue. The microphone, as you might guess, is 
photoshopped in. Uh, but you can see from his stance that he was made for this stuff. So let me just take our uh, our listeners through some of these um, some of these basic points. Cicero, who was this guy that lived two thousand one hundred years ago? All right. So uh, first, I want to ask the audience a question here. So a Roman soldier walks into a bar, goes over to the bartender, holds up two fingers in a V, and he says, five, please. <laughs> now, you either get this right away, maybe you don't get it. You know the Roman numeral is a five. But there's a reason I'm starting with a joke, and it's one of the ideas that comes out of the book. Uh, so this is the book here, How to Tell a Joke, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Humor. Cicero, you will see, I'll, t- I'll explain this, stand-up console. In a second. I just had to share this, by the way, though, uh, in Australia over the weekend, a national paper had a write-up of the book. And so you will decide whether it was a big news day or a slow news day. The top news story was a ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal. You probably might have heard something about that. Second most important news item in the world was Cicero coming back to life here. There we go. That's one view of the world. All right. And as I said, this is a book that uh, it does grow out of my academic expertise in Latin, but it's not just um, academic. I spent my entire career studying humor in the ancient world. Uh, I wrote a dissertation on it many years ago. I've written a bunch of books about it. But this book comes at least out as much out of my experience in the professional workplace, uh, in higher ed and in other contexts, from having to get people to go, uh, go along with an idea, sign on something, break up the tension. As you sort of mentioned, I've spent uh, the last eight years here at Cornell doing all these different um, leadership roles, some of them volunteer, some, um, some not. Uh, but in all these situations, humor saves the day over and over and over. Project management, when we were butting heads about costs, internal debates, public debates, diplomacy. Humor is great for all this stuff. Uh, and what I learned in this context, uh, surprising to me, is that a lot of professional people are actually sort of scared of humor. Uh, and so they need a book that can show them sort of the rules of how it all works um, for public speaking, business, lawyers, teachers, all these people. So I've already teamed up with E. Cornell, maybe we'll talk about that after, to actually bring Cicero out of the grave 2,100 years later and put that guy to work and teach his principles today. Uh, these, the principles are universal. They work all around the world, regardless of your language. Timeless, they're proven, and I'll get to that in a second. And I say no one's ever written this book before, except it was written. It was just forgotten. So uh, a quick thing to say, everybody knows this, all magic spells and arcane knowledge, it's always in the back. So is this book. So I've taken it out of Latin, and I've tried to put it in some fun English that will entertain you. So let's get back to your question. This is Cicero here, the man behind the mic. So most people look at that, and they see this ancient statue. You say, well, who's that guy? Well, there's a really gifted artist in Florence today, a guy named Alessandro Tomasi. He gave me permission to share. This guy does photorealistic reconstructions of ancient busts. So that's a fairly good guess of what Cicero looked like way back then. Here's his dates, 106 to 43 BCE, which is a way of saying when Jesus was born, that was 43 years after Cicero died. Uh, So he lived a bit before that. So the book actually includes two authors. We've got Cicero over there on the right, and over here on the left is this guy, a guy named Quintilian, uh, much, much, much less famous. He lived about 150 years after Cicero, 150, 200 years after And so they give us two different perspectives. I've translated both of their treatises on humor. The guy on the left is like me. He's a professor. His job is to distill best practices from what he sees other people do. Over on the right, though, you have Cicero. He's the guy that they call the man in the arena. He was the consul of ancient Rome. And this is tricky because consul is an English word, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Consul in Latin means the president of ancient Rome. So Cicero was basically the president of ancient Rome. Uh, it was the system's a little bit different. They had two presidents, but he was president in his year, and he told a lot of jokes. So this uh, this book, is, uh, you'll see, I just highlighted the word "selected." So the treatises are embedded in much longer works that nobody reads. In part, your eyes would glaze over if you tried to read cover to cover. This stuff, some is pretty boring, but this stuff is built in segments, and it's clear that it was meant that way. So we pulled them back out and got rid of all the junk. So let's talk about Cicero. Um, this is from Quintilian, the beginning of Quintilian's speech. And this is sort of interesting. He says, you know, laughter seems like a minor thing that any stand-up comedian, any street performer, any idiot can get laughs. Because nevertheless, laughter does have this certain overpowering and conquering force 
where all resistance is futile. You know, this has happened to you. I can see it. I, I bet it's happening right now to some people. Laughter oftentimes erupts from us, even against our will. It often squeezes a confession from the face and the voice, and it even rocks your whole body forcefully. And this is the most important part, he says. As I said, though, laughter can change the course of the most serious matter since it zaps anger and animosity with great frequency. And his idea seems to be if you can physically get people laughing, it does something to the embodied emotions. I mean, who knows if it's chemical or if it's uh, blood pressure or whatever it is, but something works. This stuff works. And he says, let me give you an example. Once upon a time, there's these young men, these college-age guys in the southern Italian city of Turin. They're at this dinner party, and they start, they're drinking, they start saying a lot of really nasty things about the king. When they were brought in to explain themselves, they were arrested. There was no denying or defending it. They escaped with a laugh and a well-timed joke. The king says, what do you have to say for yourself? And one of them quips, no, oh, man, if we hadn't run out of booze, we would have killed you. <laughs> <laughs> the king says, that witticism melted away all the hard feelings over the charge. The king got the giggles and said, all right, you guys, you chuckleheads just go. They say their lives. He says, that's what laughter can do. It's kind of like magic. So how does this magic work? So Cicero talks about this. He says, when it comes to humor, there's basically five questions you can ask, right? He says, I'm going to outline the whole shebang. Here's the five questions. What is laughter? Where does it come from? Should a public speaker, an orator, want to make people laugh? That's not an obvious question. If yes, well, then how much? And last, what are all the different kinds of jokes that exist in he says, all right, take number one. He said, what laughter is, how it's aroused, where it dwells, how it arises and erupts so suddenly that we can't stop it, even though we want to, and how it can simultaneously take over its sides, mouth, cheeks, eyes, face. He says, I don't know, go ask some Greek philosopher about all of that. He says, none of that's relevant to what we're interested in. And even if it were, I, I had no trouble admitting, I have no idea. He says, we're not interested in the metaphysical stuff. We're interested in how to use humor to get ahead in public life. Yeah. Okay. And he says, yes, it's in your interest to use humor in public speaking. Why? He says, when you give people the giggles, they side with you reflexively. They say, oh, yeah, it is. He says, everybody admires a zinger, often concentrated in a single word, especially in a comeback, though also as a first strike. But now we can amp it up. He says, you can use humor to crush your opponent, to trip him up, ridicule him, deter him, defeat him. He says, telling a joke shows you that the speaker himself is sophisticated, educated, urbane, and most of all, because laughter and joking eases hurt and breaks the tension. And when problematic facts can't be argued away, a joke and laugh often make them go, Poof. There's a, a quote that I embedded in the beginning here. This is another guy, a famous poet from uh, about a generation after Cicero. And he says, a joke usually cuts through matters of importance more efficiently and more effectively than severity. You know, if you think about that, it's kind of true, right? Let's say you don't like something. You could shake your fist at the sky and scream from a soapbox. You could write letters to the editor or whatever, but sometimes a joke will do it all for you like a laser beam. Watch this. I got an example. Some people in the audience may remember this. This, for me, is one of the greatest of all time. Ten years ago, Ohio State University, there was a scandal with football coach. So the football coach, Jim Trousel, had beaten this year, won a bowl game, and finished the season ranked number five in the nation. For doing that, Trestle was paid by this university basically four million bucks in cash and compensation. Some people at the time thought that might be a little too much money for a university employee. So it caused a scandal. And when the Ohio State president of the whole system, Gordon Gay, was asked whether he'd given any thought to firing the football coach, for the scandal that erupted, his response was to make a joke. He said, I'm just hoping that the coach doesn't dismiss me. <laughs> Boom. Oof. The mask drops, and it's clear to everybody all around where the power at Ohio State University really lies. may not actually be true, but boy, did it suggest volumes with that one line. Gordon Gee lived to fight another day. Jim Trestle did not, by the way. He even left. Gordon Gee is still a president, so he's had an amazing career. That's what a joke can do. All right. So if you're going to tell jokes in public life, how far should you take it? He says, that's something we need to think hard about because you're not up there to entertain people like a buffoon or a jester. He says, there's another uh, thing to worry about. Humor is risky 
since wit is so close to twit. You know, you want to be witty, but you don't want to be a twit or start twitting people and get them angry at you. It's a fine line. And by the way, Cicero, to get back to your question, he lived this. He was assassinated himself in the year 43 BCE by Mark Antony, the famous lover of Cleopatra. Why? I just want to take you back a couple steps to explain that. Let's go back. Here's how I begin the book. Is humor a teachable skill or is it something you're born with? So Cicero had some ideas about that. That's what he lays out here. And this answers your question from earlier, Chris. A, a guy about five centuries after Cicero says, the two most eloquent men that antiquity ever produced, the comedian Claudius and this guy Cicero, were also its two best at telling jokes. Who doesn't know that Cicero's enemies routinely used to call him the stand-up consul? And that's amazing. They were saying he was a stand-up president. They didn't mean he was a stand-up guy, a good fellow. They meant he was a president who told so many jokes he reminded them of a stand-up comedian. Here's an example. There was a candidate running for office. Guy's dad was believed to be a cook. And when he went to ask a man for his vote, Cicero was standing by. He piped up. He says, well, roast the sure. I'll support you. Quintilian, or other author, he looks at him and he says, that's kind of stupid. He says, that verges on stand-up comedy. That's not something the president thought to say. Uh, so I said, Quintilian's right to be concerned. The line between wit and buffoonery can pose a serious threat to dignity. But here's the crazy catch. This is the most important thing. Cicero also knew it could be a source of power. He emphasizes that humor can collapse the distinction between an orator and a comedian, between a political rally and stand-up comedy. You do it just right, it can bring you social and political power, maybe even win you in a election. You say, wow, that's a crazy idea. Jokes are the physical manifestation of how you're going to get uh, use humor to get ahead. What did Cicero do? He was, a, he was a trial lawyer. And we're told by his ancient biographer, Cicero would ignore protocol at trials. He would joke around, using irony to laugh away serious arguments. The point was to win the trial. And he won a lot of those trials. Murder trials, some of them. He won with jokes, but he couldn't, shouldn't have won. Now, there's a famous line in here I put into the introduction. Cicero has a character say, this is the hardest thing for quick-witted people to do. And if anybody listening is a natural wit, you know this is true to take stock of the people, the circumstances, and to hold back the quips that come to mind, even when it would be totally hilarious to say them. You know, so you're sitting through some meeting, somebody just opens the door and you say, I'm just gonna lay down a joke, and then you have to bite your tongue, you can't do it. And Cicero wrote that himself, but he failed to heed his own advice and it cost him his life. So about 10, 12 years later, after writing this, Cicero was hunted down and murdered. Uh, 12 years after publishing his treatise, which was his masterpiece. The goon squad was sent by this guy, Mark Antony, a politician turned warlord that Cicero had roasted in this merciless series of political speeches. So he didn't even heed his own advice, and he wound up getting killed for it. Okay, a couple more points, and then maybe we'll chat some more. I'll give you some samples. What is humor? We have this word, right? It's a funny thing. In humor, uh, in Latin, the word humor means biochemical. I mean, we talk about chemistry of the body. The Romans talked about humors of the body. So people in ancient Rome, they didn't know anything about genes, but they knew a lot about genetics. They weren't stupid. They could see that some characteristics are required and others are in, innate. So innate comes from their word for genetics. Natura, which means the condition of your birth. They could also see predispositions, right? I mean, it's like golf, right? Uh, it's obvious that certain abilities just come more easily to you or me than other people. Sports, singing, public speaking, even telling a joke. So in theory, if you were born with just the right balance of humors, like Cicero, you'd be a humorous person. You'd be a wit, or as they would say in Latin, a natural, a genetic genius. What if you weren't, though, right? Could you become one? Can people listening actually get better at telling jokes? Uh, so that is sort of the tip-off for the entire treatise that I translate. The treaty is kind of interesting. I said, you've got a good idea to share with the world, right? There's a few different ways you can do it. You can write an article. Nobody reads those. You can give a TED Talk. That's very popular. Uh, or you can make it into a poem. That sounds nuts. Nobody does that today, but people used to do that a lot. Or you can make it into a movie. Well, they didn't have movies back then, but they had movie scripts. And that last option, the movie script, is the traditional format for presenting cool ideas. So instead of just telling us what to think, as I'm doing right now, that's the easy, lazy option. That's what Quintilian does in our book. Cicero creates a movie dialogue, 
or script, and it constructs an imaginary world for everybody to kind of animate inside their heads. It gives everybody a little personality. And I thought, I just, before I give you my samples, right, styles of translation vary. So some are literal. Others go for the gist. This translation goes for the jest. Trying to keep it fun and fun. So here's some samples. You want to see what the Romans laughed at? Shifting. So Quintilian says, if you get in hot water, here's the kind of joke you could tell. He says, a funny example is the denial of this guy Quintus. He's on trial. The prosecution made a visual presentation for the judges of him. And in every image, he was either sitting naked in the public stocks or getting bailed out at the poker table by his friends. So he quipped, sheesh, didn't I ever win? <laughs> and this worked. He says there's also statements that in order to underplay or exaggerate something, they surprise us by going totally over the top. For instance, in another public speech, this guy Crassus quipped, Memmius thinks he's such a towering figure that when he comes into the Roman Forum, he has to duck under the Fabian Arch. You see the triumphal arches of Rome, they're pretty tall. Here's another one. Uh, this is from Quintilian. So he, uh, justification is the technique for getting out of hot water. You have this upper middle class guy. He blew through his inheritance. And when the emperor reprimanded him, he quipped, out of his mind. <laughs> okay, another example, uh, you could say sarcasm. This guy Scipio in Spain is so angry at the stupid guy that he said, if his mother had had one more kid, it would have been a donkey. So this is me trying to translate a pun in Latin. It's not as easy to do. Uh, but the, the word for a donkey in Latin, as you know, means a jackass, but it's a common word for a blockhead or a moron. Uh, okay, now Cicero says some of these jokes you have to be careful because they're really tasteless. Here's an example. He's got this guy. He wants to be witty, but sometimes he takes it too far. It comes like Sam. He says, uh, I'll come have dinner at your house. He tells this one-eyed friend of mine. By the way, in ancient Rome, a lot of people seem to have been missing an eye. They talk about it all the time. He says, I'll come have dinner at your house, Gaius Sextus. I see you got a place for one. <laughs> should you laugh? Should you not laugh? Since we said, don't tell that kind of joke if you're a leader. That's not funny. You don't want to see the president of Cornell University saying that at a graduation speech. All right, you can also do inconsistencies. You can say, this guy has it all, except money and redeeming qualities. All right. Uh, now, I'm going to just show you a couple more examples before talking about what you can do with this. Rebuttal is another technique they want to teach you. You can rebut a charge when you're being accused of something by pretending you're in agreement. For example, Dolabella's wife claimed to be 30 years old. Cicero quipped, it's true. I've been here to say that for 20 years now. <laughs> Okay, those are some of the jokes, but why study this stuff, right? So one of the characters addresses, he says, what's the point of studying jokes? He says, the power, the value of joke rules isn't that textbooks can help you figure out the jokes to say. It's that once you have a joke, wherever you get it from, inspiration, thinking hard, trying stuff out, once you have a joke, you'll have the confidence, confidence that it's right or appropriate, or you'll understand that it's wrong since you'll have the standard to kind of check it against. So you want to know when jokes are inappropriate or appropriate. Some of what they have to say is kind of counterintuitive. It's true. I'll give you a couple examples. For example, he says puns. Puns are supremely clever. But puns don't often get big laughs as much as compliments. Oh, that's cute. That's clever. And it's kind of true. You think people don't fall out of their chairs over a pun. <laughs> He says, for example, this soldier Titius liked to kick a soccer ball around at night. He was suspected of breaking some important statues. When his friend asked why he hadn't shown up for his morning workout, this guy quipped, oh, it's okay. He said he broke an arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's another one. This guy, uh, uh, a guy grins when this guy Philippus tells some smelly guy, he sniffs, he says, seems you've Goat me surround it. Ouch. <laughs> uh, all right. See, these are groaners, right? And they say this stuff, it, it'll get you a groan or, oh, that's clever. But it won't get you the social capital anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, I got a few. Yeah, I'm gonna see, this one's not that fun. 
But here, what are the social power of jokes? Let me give you an example. How can you use jokes in public life? Once upon a time, this, there's this guy, Nasita. He'd come to the house of the poet Ennius. And when he asked for Ennius at the front gate, the maid says, Ennius wasn't home. So Nasika sensed she'd said that at her master's behest, and that Ennius really actually was at home inside. So a few days later, when Ennius came to Nasika's house and asked for him at the front door, Nasika himself shouted, I'm not home. And Ennius said, huh? I recognize your voice. You son of a bitch, said Nasika. He said, when I came looking for you, I believed you're made that you weren't home. Aren't you going to believe me myself? You see this, you box somebody in with a joke. You let them know that you understand everything. But it allows the person to kind of get sheepish and then reset relations. One more example of this. Uh, Quintilius says, the absolute best is hoisting the faker by his own guitar. So there's this guy, Domitius Offer. He's this elderly dude, right, Domitius Offer. He had drawn up his will long ago. And one of his newer friends hoped to finagle something by getting him to reassign his bequests. So he concocted a story, and he went to ask after his advice. He says, you know, there's this elderly officer. He's, um, he's already drawn up his will. But uh, should I have him arrange for his last and absolute final wishes? Don't, replied Afer. You're offending him. <laughs> he knew who the story was about. Okay. I said at the very beginning, and then I'll end our slides here. A uh, famous quote that I've always loved, he says, this guy says, I wish Cicero would rise from the dead. So that's what we're doing with this E. Cornell thing. Uh, I've been working all month, and we are so excited. We're going to put these techniques to use. Say Cicero in executive education. And I'm telling everybody, yes, absolutely, you bet, right? This is the best opportunity to put his techniques to use today, make Rome seem a little less remote, more alive. So how are we doing this? We have a two-part course. The first is using humor for influence, personal influence, like a job interview, cocktail party, giving a toast, uh, giving a speech in front of a bunch of people. And the second is humor in the workplace, how to get along, how to tamp down humor if you have a fungineer who won't be quiet. You have a humble brag, you're trying to neutralize that dude, whatever it takes. Uh, all these characters are everywhere. You think like the TV show The Office, that's what we have in mind. So it's been a ton of fun and it's working. Um, but with that, I think I should probably uh, call it quits on the slideshow, Chris, and maybe we could have a little discussion about some of this and other questions. Or, if you yeah, plenty so. of questions rolling in. Thanks for that, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, several emergent themes are coming through in the questions. I think we can get a few done at once. Uh, you know, I should ask you, um, are there certain types of styles of humor that Cicero excelled at, uh, among others, uh, like ad hominem kind of attacks, personal jabs, sometimes brutal verbal public takedowns, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, should we think about staying away from that in the workplace, in the business organizational environment? How do, you know, what works when and how do we think about this? Chris, I think you missed the slide where I said he was murdered. <laughs> well, no, yeah. the answer to without a doubt, right? Yeah. Cicero's humor is brutal. Right. brutal. Uh, some of it is outright nasty. Uh, the very last pages of the book, I tucked in a little bit. I said, the name of this book is How to Tell a Joke. But I'm going to add a little section, How to Take a Joke, where Cicero was mercilessly ridiculing this guy for his private beliefs. And the guy sort of twits him and, and regains the whole audience. Yeah, so Cicero took it way too far, even by the standards of his own time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was generally seen as the funniest, uh, but also as an obnoxious sort of jackass, for lack of a better word. And so what should you stay away from? Well, I would never recommend targeting people for their private beliefs in the workplace, right? Uh, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, uh, but not calling people names. But then there's some counterintuitive stuff. For example, people, um, uh, when they're new in a career, will often try to make a joke um, that seems like a, a funny joke you would make to, with a senior colleague and where you're trying to show you respect their experience enormously, right? So to a young person starting out old sort of conjures up ideas of like reverend, experienced, wise and mature. But those jokes often land very badly from other people's perspectives. And so the, they say you should really stay away from tell, making any kind of joke about someone's long experience. Um, very counterintuitive stuff for some of this. Yeah, exactly. I have, a, I have a couple of good questions coming in from the audience. I want to thank EK for this question here. Help me out. I'm considered spontaneously funny 
but my joke telling skills aren't so great because I usually flub the punchline. Uh, what suggestions can you offer someone like me? Second part, this is my question. Uh, there's a section in the book, it may very well be in the intro, where you cite Cicero and his thoughts on being humorous. You have discussed this a moment ago as either a teachable skill. There's a certain bit of inherent uh, skill and ability that, that maybe should come with this. And there seem to have been two, two, two arguments around this, right? You're either born funny or you can learn it. Where do you stand, Michael? So I've asked, uh, let me get to that second part, and then I'll get to the specifics. Yeah, uh, I've asked stand-up comedians. I've asked uh, humorists. I interviewed Joel Stein. He wrote a famous column for Time Magazine for 17 mm-hmm. years. It's all in the introduction. And uh, it seems that every, uh, every comedian agrees you have to have some baseline bet. But if you do have any natural anything, you can fan the flame into something good. So how do you do that, right? First, you go for the practical stuff on the delivery. So this gets back to the audience question, right? Cicero is very clear on this. So is Quintilian. They say, for example, if you want to be funny and maintain your dignity, don't make comedic faces when you're telling a joke. Mm-hmm. Leave that stuff for the stand-up comedians. You're not a clown. So you want to keep a uh, deadpan as a fantastic delivery. And then, yeah, how do you get better at the timing and the punch lines? So that's really important, right? Uh, you're either really good at that or you need to practice. Uh, so if you have a story joke, you want to just practice it, hammer it away till you know the details and you deliver it at home. And then you can drop the bomb in your public setting. It'll go off great. Um, but I recommend that everybody have a go-to joke, two go-to jokes. One is a one-liner, or like a little zinger that will diffuse whatever tension you need. And the other would be a little story joke. Uh, and so you want to have both of those at hand for whatever situation you might want to deploy. And the more you try, the better you'll get. Yeah, perfect. Uh, quick quick uh, note for the audience. The courses that Michael uh, has been working on have yet to launch. Uh, we're looking at April, May, sometime around then. So, um, you know, I would just suggest kind of staying in tune with keynotes. You know, once you, once you watch one, you're essentially a subscriber and you receive notifications in your email once a week. Um, so heads up for that, right? I think we'll do hopefully one, one, another one of these uh, once the course is launched. But, you know, if, even if you're mildly curious, you can contact us at eCornell and we'll keep you posted on the, uh, on the launch and publication of those courses. So quick note there. Um, I love the value. There's a section in the book uh, talking about the value of a comeback of quick wittedness. Uh, There's a section where Crassus and Brutus kind of cover this thing. Um, And I love how you frame this. You write, in effect, I'm I'm sort of paraphrasing here, the comebacks are more powerful than unprovoked cut downs because they do two things. The quickness of someone's mind appears greater in response and comebacks also display good manners that we never would have said anything if not attacked, you know, were, were provoked. Actually, that is a quote. So tell me a little bit about this, the thoughts on comebacks and quick wittedness. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I, that, that's Cicero, and I agree with every word of what he wrote. I mean, it makes sense. When you hear somebody uh, come back with this brilliant response, some retort, some repost, whatever, you, it, it just shows you the person's a total genius. They're quick thinking, and you wonder, how are they doing the mental gymnastics to think that quickly? Uh, and you think, well, I mean, if you were not that bright, you wouldn't be able to do it at all. So it does sort of hint at this iceberg effect of pure genius all bubbling under the surface. And that's the second point, right? If nobody had ever said anything, you, nobody would ever know how quick-witted you are. Uh, but where this is, the flip side of that is, as Cicero and Quintilian both say, if you go around telling jokes all day long, you don't, you're not coming across as the wit that you think you are. People are laughing at you rather than with you. And I say, oh, yeah, that, that guy is a bit of a bozo or, she really needs to tamp it down. You know, this is work. It's not a comedy club. Um, so I agree with that completely. That said, what's cool is, um, especially toward the, the types of jokes, they break all these down. And uh, this is still true today. The sitcom writers tell me that jokes are, as Joel Steinberg he says, jokes are math. They are reducible to formulas. And once your mind gets thinking in certain directions, you know immediately, you will get better at this. You know exactly how to seize on some aspect of what the person has just said and blow it all out of proportion to, uh, to make it sort of a funny joke. You know, exaggeration, diminution, moving it further to the left, moving it further to the right, you knew all this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, pivoting off the comeback quick wittedness part, by the way, no better way to win an audience, right? Audiences just go crazy at a great comeback. It's, it's more powerful than almost anything. Um, let's talk about how to take a joke. Uh, maybe maybe uh, a witty retort is not the best way to deal with it, right? Is there anything written about how to take a joke, how to deflect it? Should, should you come back or should you let the humorist 
have their moment and take it in good humor, like a roast per se, right? Uh, what I mean, there's where what's more dignified, right? Should you ignore it? Is it perceived as conceding defeat if you don't have a comeback? Is there a place for just kind of hanging back and letting letting it happen? These are all great questions. Yeah, this is what I put at the very end of the book: how to take a joke, and a lot will depend on number one on how you feel relative to the person telling the joke. So we're talking a lot about this in the courses, right? But all jokes are basically hostile in nature to some degree, more or less. And there's always this power differential. So humor is always asymmetric. And uh, Cicero and Quintilio both say, don't punch down on people. It doesn't get the laughs that you think you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So if the joke teller is, uh, let's say, somebody on your same team, and you think you can retort, then I would say go for that. If you're being punched down on, though, this is what's happening at the end of the book. So Cicero, that year, was the president. He was the consul. And he's arguing, he's got this hopeless case. He's trying to defend a guy who's being prosecuted for bribery. He's totally guilty. And so he starts ridiculing Cato the Younger's private, we would say, religious beliefs, his philosophical beliefs. And so Cicero is going on and on telling all these jokes. Cato just sits there deadpan. And when he's done, Cato turns around and he says, what a funny consul we have, folks. And that's what you do. What you do is you, you take it in stride and you use inclusive language. Hey, folks, we have a so-and-so. And there's a fine line between a dignified joker and a buffoon. And you basically thrust the joke teller onto the far line and make that person cast them as a buffoon. Uh, I said, in, in a way, it's a lot like um, like a Western movie, the end of a Western movie. Mm-hmm. Cowboy here and a cowboy here and a gun on the ground in between them. Whoever picks it up, shoots and lives. Whoever does it, gets shot and dies. And that's what these jokes can be like, depending on the situation and the severity of it. Um, I will say this, though. uh, The more you can take a joke, no matter how painful it is, the better off you look to everybody else. I mean, of course, if it's gone way too far, then a a good comeback is saying something like, you know, the worst thing about Christmas parties is having to look for a job the next day. (laughs) People think twice, right? Uh, It's a... If you hint that a, a call from HR is coming in the morning, that will usually tamp it down. But if you can take it in stride, you will look dignified. It's great. Good good advice. I've got All right, let's go to a little hot tips and tricks section here because that's the way the audience is kind of thinking. Uh, I've got two questions here to hit you with. Um, Amy and Sasha are thinking along the same lines. Sasha asks, how do you weave jokes into a narrative when you're writing a speech without detracting from the content. Um, and Amy asks, how do you open a meeting with a joke to get people's attention, right? So there's a balance to be stricken here. You don't know the room that well, right? You haven't really read it, but you've got a joke prepared. What do you have to think about when you're doing something like this? Great, let me answer the second question first. So when you open with a joke, when you tell any joke in public life, you have gotta do a cost benefit analysis. But the first step is what is your goal? What do you want by telling the joke? So you want to think long-term, short-term. If you go in with a joke and it bombs, you might actually be forgiven. So that actually is not the calculation. If you want to arrest the attention of your audience, definitely start with a joke. But here's the secret. It doesn't have to be, it shouldn't even be, some hilarious crack-up joke that makes people fall out of their seats. All you need is a chuckle. And it's like magic. It transforms the whole room and gets them on your side. So you want a corny joke. The book talks about this. You tell a corny joke, you don't even dare hint at obscenity. You never tell an obscene joke, but you don't even hint at it. But you tell a corny, cheesy joke. Uh, as I say, the book is full of cheesy jokes. It's not for the lactose and power. <laughs> That's not that funny of a joke, right? It's right. enough. It's yeah. enough. And that will win the audience. That's what they, they keep saying. You want to win the audience. Uh, mm-hmm. the first, um, so the first question was about the technique that they call in the book uh, sort of banter. Mm-hmm. Shtick. I translated it shtick in the book. Yeah. Uh, so they distinguish between shtick and sick burns. You know, the sick burn is absolutely just a killer, the bullet that just ruins someone's day if you land something. But the banter you want to weave all through the speech. And again, what are your goals? Are you trying to win the audience or are they already on your side? Uh, are they getting bored or distracted? So those are the, do uh, you need to break tension? Those are the main three goals, right? Boredom, uh, hostility, break tension, a very either awkward tension or tight, taut, focused tension on something. So once you identify that, then you can work the jokes in. Um, so when I do lectures in, in various courses, I try to weave a joke in every seven to 10 minutes, depending on the topic, right when I think they're getting bored. 
Um, it's different in a smaller meeting if I'm not doing a prepared speech, but um, I've had a couple of total wins where I reversed uh, the entire gravity of the, the entire momentum of the meeting uh, with a, a go-to joke that I always share. And it gets everybody thinking and for, uh, it can just sort of break everything off. But again, you would want to rehearse that kind of joke. That's different from the shtick that you're talking about. That you want to work in from the get-go. Uh, tension is a key word that jumped out at me there. Um, is it important to bring humor to, to really high-tension environments and situations? Is there a time and place, or does, does humor really best belong in low-stakes kind of conversations? What, when, when is it appropriate? How do you know? Yeah, appropriate is a key word. I would say it definitely belongs in high stakes. Uh, it, it, essential in high stakes debates. Uh-huh. There's, a great, there's a great line I've gotten from an executive friend of mine, and that is, we take the work seriously, but we don't have to take ourselves seriously. And the problem is that the more intense a debate gets, the more prone to sort of polarization, the more prone to taking things personally, the more invested people get in whatever it is you're debating. And the joke can break that tension by reminding the whole room, right? I mean, that the world is not this fictitious place. You know, that's what all humor is about, right? Noticing that the world is not the utopia that we were all promised, or that it looks like on TV or social media. Yeah, there's dirt under the rug. And so, uh, so again, you would want to keep it within due limits. Um, but if a, if a meeting is getting really intense, especially let's say if it's a disciplinary meeting, where somebody's been caught with their hand in the cookie jar and you need to decide which people tend to get really vindictive in these things and people lose sense of proportion. Uh, so a classic joke people tell is, you can use this, by the way, if you're being criticized. If you screw it up and say, oh, you know, Chris, you really blew it on this thing. Hey, folks, why don't we just take me, throw me out in Cayuga Lake and see if I flew it. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, oh, maybe we're being a little hard on the guy. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, you had you had discussed, especially in those high stakes situations, the idea of rehearsing, preparing for it, you know, working on your stuff. Uh, there's a question from Max, uh, Max who asks, uh, to what extent can watching jokes, comedy routines, help to develop one's own approach to comedy um, to help us kind of discover our voice and how to identify it and run with it? So the answer to that is, in the book they say explicitly, you don't want to watch stand-up comedians to, for uh, mastering professional if you want to be a stand-up comedian, that's a great way to do it, right? But the one thing you don't want to be is a stand-up comedian. You want to come across as a confident, empathetic leader. And you do that by having a due sort of measured sense of humor. But if you tell too many of these jokes, then you get cast as a clown, and that's what you don't want. So I would say yes and no. The one thing that stand-up comedians are great at is timing, the delivery, right? So timing and keeping a straight face or whatever face you want to roll with. Some people go, you know, a little grin. Dave Chappelle is the master of the wry grin. Yeah. <laughs> you laugh just looking at his face. Yeah. Um, um, other people master, you know, the, the deadpan. Um, but you don't want to be, you know, wagging your tongue and rolling your eyes. Don't do that, as some comedians do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a question from viewer Sally who asks, would you give us an example of one of, one of your one-liner jokes uh, that, um, that are in your arsenal? I don't know. What do you got? Yeah, one-liner joke. Uh, it's not my own Nobody's jokes are their own. So nothing gets stolen faster than a joke. But one that is uh, historically effective is if you are in a really hot, let's say you are running a meeting, project team or whatever it is, and you got everybody around the table and you're trying to surface their opinions and somebody is getting increasingly heated, you know, we've got to do X, 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 X is the greatest thing of all time. We must do X. Y is a horrible decision. We're not going to do that. You skip a beat and then you say, hey, you know what, folks? We're going to take Chris out of the undecided category. That makes things a little easier. <laughs> Amazingly, that joke, if you practice that, will not make Chris or whoever it is feel embarrassed. So the most important thing is you don't want anyone to feel embarrassed, especially the person you're targeting, but you are trying to restore proportion. You know, we've been talking about jokes in, um, in an oral delivery kind of capacity almost throughout this entire discussion here. Kathy asks, and this is a really interesting question, should one ever ins- insert a humorous line into a cover letter? Um, I, I have an answer for that. You tell me what you think. So I, I, the answer is yes. Warren Buffett is a master of doing this kind of thing because humor can soften bad news. Now, not all bad news. You don't want to soften. Quintillion says you don't want to make jokes about heinous crime. Yeah. But if the stock underperformed a little bit or – you know, you miss targets, but you didn't miss them by a mile, but you missed them by a little. Humor can soften that. But the critical thing is, the second you put pen to paper, 
or you forward the email or the text or the meme or whatever you're doing, it's not coming back. So you have got to think very, very, very hard before you build humor into any kind of recordable event. Zoom, anything you want to do. So that's going to be part of the cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's such a great way to provide someone else with insight into who you are. It immediately kind of makes you real, flesh and blood, uh, someone who's, and, and frankly, someone who's courageous enough to, to take that chance, right? Not knowing. So what you just said is exactly right, Chris. I mean, it shows people that we're all flesh and blood. That, that's all we are, right? So when you tell jokes, it humanizes you to everyone you work with, and it should that you trust them enough to show a softer, more vulnerable side of yourself. That what you said is exactly right. Yep. And so it builds trust and confidence, sort of team confidence. Let's talk about the different types of funny people. Um, you know, we all, I work in a pretty large workplace. There's 350 of us or something like that, right? And, and everybody, you know, uh, the funny people each have their own kind of thing. Can we talk about the different types of funny people? There, there was some delineation in your book uh, that you had written about, right? What distinguishers, what distinguishers an orator from a stand-up, from a street performer, you know, from the, the lowly clown, you know, on the, on, the street, on the street and so on. There's lots of distinguishing between types of comedians and types of jokes. Some are about, this is the thing that I'm, I want to ask you about. Uh, some of the jokes were about language and some are about the thing. Can you explain this concept? Yeah, definitely. So language and thing is the fundamental split of all ancient Rhetoric. So rhetoric sounds already a little different in English than it does in the ancient context, but public speaking. So the fundamental split in public speaking between language and thing, or we could say language and situation. And so this is kind of interesting and it might be counterintuitive. So they say when you tell language jokes, jokes based on puns or word plays or something like that, those uh, are what comedians do, professional comedians. It's alienating to a lot of people. Because some people don't get it, other people do, and they think it's great, but they don't associate it with sort of a confidence-building thing. Uh, and, of course, any of us that work in an office where English is not the native language uh, for everyone, you know that it's going to be alienating to say that kind of joke. So the better option, they always say, for professionals is situational humor. Little story jokes or jokes based on the absurdity of whatever thing you've noticed. Um, very emphatic on that point. Uh, the other thing is the different kinds of comedians. A comedian, uh, you see me in my stunt picture up here. <laughs> I'm not a fan of comedian. Uh, that's just for fun. We did that as a publicity stunt. But the idea is a comedian just tells joke after joke after joke after joke. And uh, a leader will use, will tell one joke, maybe two, something like that. Um, and then, of course, there's different kinds. Yeah, the street performers will tell obscene jokes. That's mm -hmm. probably too advisable in most workplaces today. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but that's why we go to those performances. We want that sometimes. Yeah, let me switch gears a little bit. In the courses that you're developing for eCornell based on the book, uh, you talk a lot about using humor when you're in the spotlight. I want to focus back to that, right? Because that can be a lonely place. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot to consider when you're in the spotlight. Tell us a little bit about that. How, um, what you do with the spotlight when you're given it. Great. So, all right, imagine the spotlight. There I am in the spotlight in our picture, right? Yep. So when we think about using humor in public life, you got to ask yourself, the first question ever is, have you stepped into the spotlight voluntarily, right? And have you accepted an invitation to give a talk? Are you in the front of the class? Or have you been thrust into the spotlight and you are trying to get out as fast as you can? That's when, for example, the New York Times calls and they want some quote from you on some bad situation. You don't want to give the quote, but you can't really say no comment. Or... You have been caught like those teenagers in South Italy saying nasty things about the king and you're brought in. What do you have to say for yourself? They don't want to say anything. They got to say something. So there are different techniques for um, maximizing the humor and your goals, depending on whether, as I say, you want to be there, you're excited to be there, you want to sell the audience something, or whether you are trying to get out of the limelight as fast as you can. And the joke is your escape hatch. Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. Um, you know, I want to go back to um, this this Sasha question. I'm really curious about this. Uh, this one's from previous when we were talking about writing a speech and detracting from the content. How about how about um, is there anything written in the book or any anything that you've kind of come across in your experience about how to then what to do after the joke? Right. You've kind of you know how to how to kind of refocus people and and make that eloquent switch 
right? Because that can that can be unnatural and clunky if not done right. Oh, you're totally right. So the, the book the book doesn't talk about it in these extracts. I think because they take it for granted. But the rules are fairly clear. You do. It's going to be a lot about timing, right? You want the laughter to spread again for as long as you want it to. Usually, the best thing to do if the joke lands very well is to simply give people a second to laugh and as a all right, though. Okay, but let's let's get serious here for a second. And that will, uh, that sort of deliberate, you know, maybe a hand gesture, and actually saying, "Let's get serious here for a second, will reset the room like magic. It actually works very, very well. Um, and then we talk about in the E Cornell course, what do you do if your firecracker is a dud, or it blows up in your face? What do you do to try and save uh, the room? And then there's different techniques. So if it's a dud, you can ignore it. If it explodes in your face, you can try different other jokes. Um, for example, if you tell a joke and it doesn't land, you're giving a speech. Uh, you can say, you know, folks, when you invited me here to talk to you today, uh, my wife said, you know, don't try to be too funny. Just be yourself. <laughs> and that, you know, of course, you adapt these, my husband, whatever it's going to be. And that one can work like magic, too. It'd be bizarre. Here's somebody who tried. And it will reset the room. You let them talk. Say, all right, you know, we're really here to talk about. It. And then you string it out. And as people are laughing at the second joke, you say, yeah, you know, I didn't think it was such a good idea. I was thinking maybe I should have tried something else. But anyway, that's in the past. So let's talk about underwater uh, exploration, whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Hey, um, you know, we kind of, uh, I want to go back to Cicero to tell you the truth. When you and I first met, uh, this was back in 2019. We did a, we did a shoot in the studio here. And, you know, uh, Cicero is a fount of wisdom, right? Uh, we can learn so much from him. You and I did a keynote called How to Make a Tough Call, Classical Lessons in Decision-Making from the Ancient World. Um, and we're going to share that, uh, that uh, URL there in, in, the, in, the, in the chat with you all, and I hope you can check it out afterward. And we have a number of other links we're going to get to in just a few minutes. We only have about seven minutes left. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that decision making, how that decision making, um, you know, the discussion that we had may apply to this, this idea of telling a joke, being humorous and all that kind of stuff. Is it, are, are there through lines or is there something that can be drawn uh, to, to, to the event that we've done before to what we're talking about today? That's a great way of thinking about it. So the book that we were talking about a couple of years ago, yeah. sort of book, it's called On Duties. And maybe some of the audience know it, others don't, but the most Interesting thing is that when the printing press was invented in Germany in the 1450s, the first book they printed was the Bible. That, Cicero's book, was the second book they printed. They thought it was that important. And it's how to live a good, happy, dignified life in a community. And so it's written to this uh, Cicero's son who was off in college studying philosophy at the time. And uh, the son, it's funny, writing home asking for money. And his father says, how are you going to grow up and make up your mind about doing the right thing? So he does have a section in there about humor. He says, stay away from the obscene jokes. Uh, stay away from, you know, you want to, the models for you are going to be this more dignified sitcom corny type humor. And he talks about a little bit about the same book. Uh, but then the rest of the book is practical wisdom. He's gone through all of Greek philosophy and tried to separate out the useful information. And uh, so the main message of that entire book is you've got to think long-term versus short-term. That is the entire calculation. And in Cicero's time, he was watching his society fall apart. Julius Caesar was on the rise. Julius Caesar was the most powerful, wealthiest person in all of history at that point. And he was murdered in a conspiracy. And Cicero's takeaway, he says, what does that tell you? That you can have short-term win, short-term win, short-term win, short-term win, and suddenly it doesn't protect you anymore. So we have to think about how to live our lives as good people to make it all the way to the end. And the way to do that is to cultivate goodwill, good faith dealings. Uh, don't cheat people even when you think you can get away with it. And it's loads of practical advice, fantastic stuff. And we talked about it in this context, you and I, in the, the statement that had come out, right, about companies doing the right thing. If they're not just maximizing profits, how can they do social good? Yeah, beautiful. I want to share a couple other things too, because if you like, if you like the road we're going down here, for those viewers, um, we, had, we did it at our second keynote, it was in 2020. Uh, it was called Timeless Odyssey, What the Ancient Greek Epic Teaches Us About Modern Mentoring. I had just fin finished Emily Wilson's uh, translation of the Odyssey. Blew my mind. I was so excited. And then to get in a room with you and talk about that was excellent, too. So I'm going to share that URL uh, with the audience. Now, you've done a lot of writing, right? Not only these a couple of the books that we mentioned. You did um, some really cool uh, LinkedIn 
LinkedIn articles uh, from last couple of years. We've got a few articles to share there. Classical lessons in business education. What is the duty of a company? Six leadership insights from the trial of Socrates. Uh, and lastly, Twitter has become the modern day Coliseum. That was an article that was uh, published in Fortune magazine. So we'll share that URL with you as well. Um, there we go. So those are the resources. Hey, let's talk about the book. There's a special offer uh, that you, we are extending to our audience. Um, you can purchase the book, uh, How to Tell a Joke, at the Princeton University Press. Um, and there is a wine and cheese discount price combo April Fool's special that we're also offering here as well, which is if you buy How to Drink, A Classical Guide to the Art of Imbibing, we'll share that URL, uh, you can get 30% off of these two. So we'll drop that information in there. Prince, the Princeton Press is a great place to, um, to purchase the books. Uh, there's also an Amazon link here that we can share as well. Um, so the book seems to be doing pretty well, right? Did you, did you sell out in the UK? What, what were you telling me earlier? I think it's out of print. To the, the Amazon seems to run out of copies in the UK, so that's good news for me. Uh, All right. <laughs> but no, I, I think so far it's doing well. People are interested and excited in this stuff. Um, I, I gave an interview to the Times UK uh, newspaper last week, and uh, people said, wow, this stuff actually, it really resonates, right? It's not ancient history. This stuff is amazing. Um, and so, you know, people have been interested in humor in a long time, but it's weird to think nobody's ever actually gone back to this sort of forgotten stuff and realized that it's already all of that and a whole lot more is already there. So it's been a ton of fun doing this. Yeah, you know, I don't know Latin myself. You're a Latin scholar, um, but I did find your translations very refreshing. Uh, apparently, you avoided the literal, right, and used easy to understand sometimes even modern terms. Uh, and that's certainly something that I experienced when reading the Odyssey. I love that. Uh, so, how did this approach to translation help bring humor to the writing? I mean, how do you creatively translate while remaining faithful to the original text? I mean, that must be a tough, tough balance to strike. How do you approach it? Uh, good question. So uh, the translation, this for me was the major effort, right? getting the translation the very best I could. Um, there's all these types of jokes and that sort of thing. And they have little names in Latin, technical names, and some of them would be English words. But I sat there and I was like, this wouldn't, it's not the same English word. So you really rack your brains trying to think, what is the concept that they're describing? And finally, it hit, you know, there's a section on observational humor. That's the Seinfeld type stuff. Yeah. Uh, did you ever notice? And, uh, and then there's stuff like non sequiturs. But um, the funny thing is some of the stuff that seems most colloquial is a straight translation. Uh, and so the Romans, what comes out beautifully in this book is the lighter side of the ancient world. Right? The Romans had the Colosseum and they had you know, wars and generals, but they also laughed a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, so straight translation was something's good. But the most important thing was getting the punch lines, right? making sure that those are fun. Um, and in prior translations, they're trying to tell you literally what's there, and then you read it, and you're like, I don't get it. <laughs> Any part about jokes where people are saying, I don't get it, that's not helpful. So uh, I, I, did, I had a couple of partners here on campus, and um, a little translation group who didn't know that, and we tried different things, and I tried these out you know, here in the neighborhood during lockdown all last year. I said, what do you folks think about this and that? So I think it should work pretty well. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, here we are. It's two o'clock. Thank you. That, that's been a wonderful hour of conversation with you, Michael Fontaine. Thank you to the audience. Uh, terrific questions that got us moving in, in, in uh, great little directions there. Uh, this event was is live. It's being recorded as well. So uh, if you want to share it afterward, simply share it, revisit the same URL that you're watching now. Uh, we'll have an edit up in just a few minutes. So um, you can certainly revisit this uh, keynote if, if you choose to do so. Again, Michael, congratulations on the publication of the book. Always a blast to see you. I hope we can get together soon sometime this summer. Thank you so much, Michael Fontaine. Thank you, audience. Bye-bye.